This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Need great health care coverage with an affordable price tag? Let Farm Bureau Health Plans coach you through it. They've been protecting Tennesseans for 75 years. With Amy Wells, I'm Mike Keith, and we are thrilled to be joined by the head coach of Titans Radio, Dave McGinnis, and the ever-reliable Rhett Bryan. Glad you guys are here. Wonderful to see you. You know, Mike Keith, when I pulled up out here to this parking lot, and saw how full it was. This is a great event. Thank you all for being here. This is way cool. We thank you. Yes, that's for you. We got off. We just got off the practice field today. Of course, clearly we just got back from Baltimore. But to come in here and to be able to see new Titans ticket holders, this is awesome, guys. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Coach. I was going to tell everybody where we were. <laughs> <laughs> After I introduced you, we're at the Wesley Mortgage Club at <laughs> Neeside Stadium at a massive event for Titans rookie season ticket members. Yes. Give yourselves a hand. Yes. Yes. This is really awesome that the Titans, first of all, has put this function together for all first-time season ticket members, and we are thrilled to be here with you guys this afternoon and this is just one of many events like this that you can be privy to and be a part of by being a season ticket member. It's an awesome experience. We're so glad to be here. You don't just get tickets. You're essentially joining an exclusive club where you get a lot of invites to do a lot of things and join us for a lot of exciting things. And the outpouring that we have had this off season with who we've added to this group is incredibly exciting for everyone in our organization, from ownership to our head coach, Mike Vrabel, our general manager, John Robinson. Our players are certainly aware of this enthusiasm, so we just say thank you. And we are so glad you're here today for the OTP. Oh, absolutely. I mean, what all of these guys said, I 1,000% echo. This is one of a tremendous amount of things that you guys now get to be a part of. All those things that you look around and you're like, oh, hey, how'd they get to do that thing? Well, this is how. This is it. You're in the club now. You're part of the family, and we're so excited to have you all here. Coach Mack. Yes, sir. These were the folks when they were the season ticket members got to come on the General Jackson with us when the draft was here. How cool an event was that? That was. See, you're part of that now. You're when part the draft of that. comes back here, and it will. Yeah, it will. You will now get to be a part of it for all the exciting things that we have, and our ticketing staff really does a remarkable job adding value. You don't just get a set of tickets and say, "Hey, come see the game." This is a thing now. No, and, and there's so much that goes with it, and and believe me, I coached for 31 years in this league. As a head coach, you don't get to interact a lot with the fans because you've got some other stuff going on, right? <laughs> but now that I've been able to do this, this is this is a part of this, being able to be on this broadcast team here for Titans Radio that I absolutely love. I can finally get out and be with the people. And so I really, I really enjoy this. And you guys joining and being part of it, you know, I'm not real smart. You can tell that already just, you know, just by what you've heard up here. But I will recognize faces quick. And uh, so I'm already finding some faces I'm going to recognize at a lot of events. All right, Coach Mack, give us your breakdown of the Titans' first preseason game last Thursday in Baltimore. Just about what, what to be expected. Played the second and the third team guys quite a bit. I think everybody was a little bit surprised. Malik Willis got the, got the start at quarterback. And Mike Vrabel, look, guys, we are so fortunate here. I've been in this league 37 years. I know good from bad. This head coach, this general manager, and this owner, they are as good as you'd want in this league. And the, the, the decision that was made to start Malik Willis, we all watch practice every day. And what Malik needs is a lot of live reps in the National Football League. And, and again, wonderful player at Liberty. But the jump from Liberty to the National Football League at quarterback, it's a huge leap. It's a huge jump, so he needed live reps. And we saw a lot of the things, and you heard what Mike Vrabel said after the game, a lot of the things you would expect early. Elite athleticism, really a great competitor. Team rallies around him. 
But there's a lot going on out there. And Mike Vrabel, you heard when he said he put him back in in the third quarter. And Mike Keith asked me this in the, in the broadcast booth there at Baltimore. Why would they put him back in? I said they want him to continue to, to do some things. They wanted him, you know, he, when you really grind the tape, you'll hear me say that a lot now, grind the tape because that's what you do to find out what these guys really are. There was, there was people open. He just got to learn to squeeze the trigger. And that's different because he has been – the, uh, his whole career being able to, you know, to forfeit to his athletic ability and just make things happen. He will still do that, but he, he left a lot of yardage out there on the, on the field with throws he didn't make, but I told Mike, I told Amy, and I told Rhett when we were up there, this tape for him is going to be such a great learning experience. There are going to be a lot of teachable moments on that tape, and you could see him at practice today. Some of those throws he was holding on to, he was letting go at practice. I can't wait to see him again out here. I can't wait to see him against the Bucks in practice because that's going to be big. But you can be excited about this guy for one reason. And I noticed it from in May when they first got here. He's the first guy out to practice. He's like a sponge standing next to Ryan Tannehill, standing next, standing next to O'Hara, the quarterback coach. He wants to absorb all of this. When you've got a player that has that type of attitude, going along with that type of athletic ability, we're going to have something here, guys. And it's going to take time, just as I always like to say, keep your powder dry on it, but be excited. It was a great third-round pick by John Robinson. Rhett, it's, it's obvious that he has things to learn, but from what we saw, he is very much a prospect, not a project. And I think what Mike Vrabel said after the fact yesterday in his media – he did okay, and they, they want to put him to the standard of an NFL quarterback because they feel like, as a prospect, he can develop into that kind of player. And the reason that he can is a lot of the things that, that Coach Mack just outlined. He's the first guy out to the practice field. He is putting in the work. You can tell he's doing it in the film room. You can tell he's certainly doing it on the, on the practice field. But the athletic tangibles are off the charts. The smarts are there. The personality is there. It's just putting everything else together. And, look, hard work is how this thing's going to work for him. And there's a lot of young men on this Titans team right now that are doing those kinds of things. You know, I, we think about Julius Chestnut is a prime example. He got the start at running back in Baltimore the other night, 30 miles from where he grew up. And the reason that he did is because – he put in the work. He came in as an undrafted free agent from Sacred Heart, busted his rear end for two weeks, and Coach Vrabel and the staff said, you know what, you've earned this opportunity, and you will serve as an example to the rest of those that say nothing's given, it's all earned. Malik Willis is going to earn it. And something I noticed about Malik Willis, just to piggyback on Rhett's point about him working so hard, after every series in the game on the sidelines, he came over and went straight to offensive coordinator Todd Downing. Every single time he checked in with him and he was absorbing the tips, he was absorbing the whatever plays they were looking at, whatever corrections they were making about his play calls. I mean, every single thing they dissected in real time so that then he could take that and go back on the field the next time the offense is on the field and make those corrections right away. They were seeing improvement from one series to the next, and that's something that you want to see. And that's something he talked about post-game is how helpful that was for him to be learning as it was happening. It wasn't theoretical anymore. It was actually tangibly happening right there. Todd Downing, in his press availability this morning, Coach Mack, made the point that they're competing for the number two job. So they are putting him in that situation where he can work against Logan Woodside to a certain extent, trying to earn that spot. And they, they get to hold him to a bit of a higher standard rather than just putting him in mothballs and saying, you're definitely the number three all year. You're absolutely correct. And, and the thing that you do as a coach – when you get your new players in, the first thing that you like to do, once you get them integrated into what you're doing as far as just the base ideas of what's going on, you look for moments where you can put them in stressful NFL situations immediately because they've got to learn to react, and they've got to learn to react fast, and, and they have to be exposed to those stress situations. I coached defense for a long time in this league, and I would tell my rookies, look, a slow, correct decision on defense in the National Football League 
hear what I said, a slow, correct decision is wrong because the game moves too fast. You've got to be able to process it, and you've got to be able to go immediately, and you've got to be able to trust what you've been taught. Then you've got to be able to trust your eyes, your instincts. That's why they're putting him in these situations right now. They're, they are not going to, to, to slow play this guy at all because he's shown that he can absorb it. Now, it's up to him to earn it, and I'm sure Logan Woodside is not going to give it up. All right, but that's what competing in the National Football League is. But I was I was really excited about what I saw, and it, it's about what I thought I would see because you, you could see him take off, you could run, but the one the one post corner that he threw in the ball game for 48 yards that's a big time throw, and then of course you know the underhand boot that he threw that's just natural that's God given right there. You know there's only so many that can do that. So I'm excited about this guy, and you should be too. Coach, on the pre-Baltimore edition of the OTP, sponsored by Farm Bureau Health Plans, who was the player you wanted to see, and how did that player do in the game? I wanted to see Racy McMath, because, I, you know, Racy McMath last year was a very intriguing player, played at LSU, didn't get a lot of, of, of balls thrown his way, because their, their receiving core was maybe one of the best in the Southeastern Conference as a group. Tremendous special teams player. You got a 6'3", 200-plus pound receiver that can run 4'3". And so the, the athletic traits were there. And just the jump that he made from year one to year two, and first of all, his body composition, and then just his, the way he carried himself and, his, and, and his, his experience, not only on the league, but his confidence. You could see him once they got back in OTAs. This is a confident dude now, and he's been showing up in practices. All those practice reports that you get, when they ever ask us, we tell you exactly what we see. We can't tell you schemes, but we can tell you what we're looking at. And player development, I wanted to see him in a ball game, and I got to see him. And you know one of the things that he did that I know, we'll talk about a 46-man roster here sooner or later, but he went down on a kickoff and made a tackle. So you say, well, Coach Mack, he's a receiver. Why is that so important? You start putting 46 out there on Sunday, those, those guys that aren't starting at positions, they got to be core team players. And so Racy McMath has put himself in that spot so far in my mind, and he was the one that I wanted to watch and see in a stress situation, and I thought he passed with pretty good flying colors. Amy, your player was Nicholas Petit Frere, rookie offensive tackle out of Ohio State. How did you think he did? Well, it's not like other positions where I can throw out flashy numbers with things he did, but he didn't do anything bad, so I think that means he did good. Realistically, for a rookie offensive lineman, a lot of that is getting those reps and making sure that nothing goes wrong. <laughs> that, that's really what you're looking for. And that's what he did. I mean, he got an opportunity to be in there. He got a chance to play and get some action, and there were no catastrophes on his watch. So I would call that a victory. Rhett Bryan, I believe your player was Roger McCrary. That's correct. Rookie defensive back out of Auburn, second-round pick. Roger McCrary did not get to make the trip because he was a little bit dinged, but he is back on the practice field now, and that's great news for the Titans. And so I'll say again, I'm looking forward to seeing him next Saturday night right here at Nissan Stadium against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But since I didn't get to see him, we did get to see Caleb Farley. He gave up one early and lost a guy early, but I thought he rebounded well. And, you know, Coach Mack will tell you how long and lean and how good this guy could be. And we're starting to see some of that. Availability is the key. Availability is clearly the key. Rhett and I, Rhett and I were sitting up there watching practice today, and they, they, they were doing a, a transition drill with the defensive backs, which, the, you know, the defensive coach, they've got two dummies set up, and, and they'll have their back to the dummies, and then he'll give them away once they get past the dummies to transition to come back to front. And what you're looking for as a coach when you're looking at guys that do that, are, are they taking extra steps, are they rounding it off, or are they breaking at a sharp angle? And, and we were watching, and, and the player that went before uh, Caleb Farley did rounded it off. I said, now, Rhett, watch Caleb Farley. And even, even as high cut as he is, which means he's got long legs, usually high cut players have a hard time breaking down and transitioning because they've got a lot to unwind. He was so quick and so fast. This is going to be a special player. And I was so happy to see him, as Rhett said, play as much as he did. He needs the time out there, too, in stress situations. Another guy who really showed up again the other night was Jack Gibbons. Jack Gibbons is a rookie undrafted linebacker. He wears number 50. And the head coach is a big fan, a, a huge fan of it. But he never refers to him as Jack Gibbons. 
he refers to him as Dr. Gibby. Well, the, the odd thing about that is, I mean, that's fine for Mike Vrabel to do that, but he doesn't realize that the people out in the public really have no idea who he's talking about. So it's our job to inform you who he is. Coach Mack, he's a pretty good-looking linebacker. You know, and, and I called him Dr. Gibby on the broadcast. Mike Keith is a professional broadcaster. I'm just what you see, okay? So I said, that's a nice play by Dr. Gibby. <laughs> Mike Keith went, you know, that's Jack Gibbons. This is, you know, but this guy, look, I coached linebackers for 20-something years in this league, and when you've got a guy that's a free agent but that comes in and then starts just, he, he just wants a chance. I, I've got a great example of that of a young linebacker that I coached that came in here that all of a sudden ended up being a really good Titans player was, was a young player from North Carolina State named Stephen Tullick. Wasn't tall enough, wasn't fast enough, but just could play ball. I think Dr. Gibby's kind of the same way. What did he have, nine tackles the other night? Did. I mean, he showed up. Those kind of guys, you know, for years when I was coaching, I, I would be in charge of the, the rookie classes when they came in, you know, orientation, just telling them what's going to happen, what's what. And the, one of the first things I've told them was is it doesn't really matter how you got in these front doors. You're in here now. Now the length that you stay is up to you. I think Dr. Gibby's taking advantage of his length to stay here. So Jack Gibbons, Dr. Gibby, as Mike Vrabel and Coach Mack call him, <laughs> 6'3", 242. He's a Texan who played at Abilene Christian, left there, and played last year at Minnesota, had 92 tackles for the Golden Gophers on what was a good team from them. I had a chance to visit with him to provide you with some more background on who Jack Gibbons, a.k.a. Dr. Gibby, really is. We'll let you listen to it now on the OTP. Jack, when did you first hear Mike Vrabel refer to you as Dr. Gibby? I mean, that was pretty quick once I got here. Uh, he likes to give people nicknames, so I guess it can't be a bad thing to have a nickname. So I'll take it and run with it. But, okay, but when you heard that, you thought, is he talking to me, right? Yeah, he, well, he had been calling me Gibby already, and then uh, after I'd been here a few days, he started adding doctor in there, and I he, I guess he told the story. I, I was a little bit confused. I was like, Coach, you know I wasn't pre-med, and he was like, I'm just, just joking with you. Like, take a joke, but, yeah, I mean, I'll take it. Okay, so all the, t all the Titans fans, though, they just hear him every time he's talking in the media, and he brags on you, which he does quite a bit, which is great. <laughs> he refers to you as Dr. Gibby, and – a lot of Titans fans have no idea who that is. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess it's a – I'll take it as a compliment. Uh, I, I try to pride myself on uh, kind of knowing what's going on, having a high football IQ and kind of studying and stuff. So I'll take it, take what I can get. Yeah, your academic All-American last year at Minnesota, though, and I guess at Abilene, uh, double major – Accounting and finance, 4.0 GPA. Maybe that's what he's referring to. <laughs> it could be, yeah. My parents made school a big deal since I was a little kid, so that's also something I like to pride myself on is just whatever you're doing, work hard at it and be the best you can be. So, The story about how you got to Minnesota. Yeah. So you're, in, you're from Texas. You're in Abilene. You decide you want to play somewhere else last year, and you say, I'm going to go to Minnesota. You'd never been there. Yeah. How does that happen? Yeah, I mean, that was uh, it was crazy. I just hopped in my truck and drove up there. No visit, nothing. It was snow all over the ground. I'd seen snow only a handful of times. So it was definitely a huge adjustment. But I had a good career in Abilene. really loved playing there. But just uh, I'd always dreamed of playing at Power 5 school, kind of big-time games like that. So I just put my name in the transfer portal, and some teams started calling. Minnesota was my first Power 5 offer, and I just felt like it was a great fit. And so I just pulled the trigger on it and decided to go. It was Why did that work out so well? Uh, I think it, I, I think it's a huge testament to it. it was just a great fit of like culture wise they they got a great family culture up there they're looking for guys that uh, are what I try to be just guys that work hard care about the team put the team first play together and uh, I just really loved it there I felt like it was a, it was a perfect fit for me and I kind of fit in scheme wise culture wise everything it was just kind of a perfect storm for you and your football career you've pretty much had to fight for everything you've gotten right. Yeah, I mean, uh, I feel like I was really, I mean, obviously I went FCS out of high school, didn't have a bunch of offers and stuff, and all I'm looking for is a chance. That's what I wanted when I came here is a chance to compete and feel like I'm getting a chance to compete, so no, nothing else I can ask for. What do you feel like you're doing well here so far in camp that's catching everybody's attention? I don't know. I'm just trying to make the most of my opportunities and create a role for myself on the team. I'm just focused on getting better every day and doing something in any way it can be, offense, defense, special teams, whatever it is, to try to help the team win and create a role for myself. I'm just kind of focused on stacking days right now and just playing the best football I can. Is it nerve-wracking to play linebacker for Mike Vrabel? 
No, I think it's awesome. I mean, a guy that's a legend at this position, guy I've watched growing up, won Super Bowls and stuff. It's super cool to kind of hear, have that perspective of somebody who's done it for a long time. It's funny in meetings and stuff, he'll he'll joke, I only played 14 years or something when guys uh, maybe don't want to do it the way he, he wants it done. So I just think it's funny. It's, it's definitely cool to have that perspective in the room. What do you have to do the rest of the way to have a chance to make the roster? I think it's just the same thing I've been doing, just put my head down, keep working, try to develop a role for myself. That's what we talk about, just uh, stacking days on top of each other, just keep trying to get better and playing the best I can. And if you have that attitude, nerves really don't get in the way, do they? No, not really. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of at a point where I'm just trying to trying to play my best football, put my best foot forward, play as hard as I can, and just kind of let the chips fall where they may. So just keep doing that, and we'll see what happens. I think they really liked that interview with Jack Gibbons, don't you, Amy? Man, that was they, a great interview, They love interview, this guy. Mike. All of them are going to get 50 jerseys, and when they come in here on Saturday night, 6 o'clock, for the game against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they're going to be so fired up because if you are one of the OT people, you know who Jack Gibbons is, and you know when he's referred to as Dr. Gibby, who the head coach is now talking about. Wow, what an interview, Mike. I, 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 I'm, a little, I'm a little emotional, emotional? at the reaction. Yeah, I, know. I mean, I thought it was good. <laughs> but Give the people I didn't what they want, it, Mike Keith. I, didn't, I mean, I've done a lot of want. interviews with undrafteds before, Red. I, I didn't have any idea it would affect people in that way. Sometimes it leaves a mark. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. You were just wonderful for doing that. So Amy and I went through an exercise earlier today. Red, I don't know if you did it too. He did. I did. Coach Mack does not like exercises. Yeah, I do, but I did it with Rhett. Okay. So the exercise that we went through, we do this every year during training camp, especially at this point. It's August 14th. We have a cut to 85 on Tuesday. We have a cut to 80 a week from Tuesday on the 23rd. And then we've got to be down to 53 on August the 30th. So what I like to do at this point to sort of ascertain how competitive the next couple of weeks are going to be. I ask everybody in our group, look at a roster and tell me who on this roster is definitely going to be on the team that you are 100% sure. Now, like you couldn't say Jack Gibbons in this case because he's an undrafted free agent. I'm not asking you to project the roster. I'm saying how many people are for certain on this football team right now? Like, Derrick Henry is obviously on the team. Ryan Tannehill, Jeffrey Simmons, so on and so forth. My number ended up being 38. Amy, what was your number? Mine was 38 as well. Wow. Yep. Rhett? 46. Wow. You only think there are seven active roster spots open right now? Yes. Wow. He's more confident than I am. Yeah, me too. Now, I do have... Six more that I circled that I'm pretty sure about. So I could go to 44. Oh, see, I went back. I did it twice okay. just for the sake of making sure I was consistent. I had 35 the second time. Okay. So I went, I went backwards. I've got more, more competition. Now, did you end up doing this, Coach Mack? Yeah, I, I, Rhett and I, Rhett and I kind of went through this our, ourselves. And the first time, the, the 46 number <clears throat> was, a, was a little high. And, and I think, it, in, my, in my personal opinion, it's somewhere around 40 to 43 okay. right now. Right now. And the other thing, Mike, uh, that I'm going to throw out there, on this sheet of paper, there are some people, maybe one, maybe two, maybe three, that are not even on this sheet of paper right. that will be on the 53-man roster. Because there is so much roster manipulation that goes on in the National Football League after the final cut. So let's say for fun, your number's 40, our number's 38. As you go into this week of practice against Tampa Bay, Wednesday and Thursday, as you go into the Tampa Bay preseason game, as you go into two practices against Arizona and a preseason game with them, there is still a lot to be determined. People had better not let up because not only could somebody else on this roster take their spot, as you alluded to, there are other guys in the league who may end up taking their roster spot. Yeah, and let, and let me talk about those stressful situations that we just visited about earlier. When another team comes to, into practice against you, that's a stressful situation 
because these guys are now used to practicing against one another for quite a while. And the, the, the familiarity that they get with how someone runs their route or how this guy is going to be in a one-on-one, -on -one, all of those things become familiar. And so what you like to do is bring the stress meter up by bringing different people in. And there are two things that happen. And I, I, I've done a lot of joint practices when I was coaching, both as an assistant and a head coach. And here's the things that you talk about as both staffs when you're talking about doing this. You want to get matchups in the drills that you want to do. The other thing that you get to do, see, when you practice against yourself, well, then you've got to service yourself, okay? Now they will have the Titans offense and the Bucks defense on one field, and then it'll be just the reversed on the other field. And so the number of reps that you can get can either be extended or they can be quality reps against the same person time after time. This is a big deal. I think having these two teams come into work against the Titans at this time, especially the younger players that we need to find out how they're going to be, quote, under the lights, this is an ideal time. I think John Robinson and Mike Vrabel did a very smart thing knowing that our first preseason game was away, but then when the other two teams agreed to stay for a week and practice before we played a preseason game, this is a big-time evaluation time, Mike, big time. Red, I think the last 16 days are going to be a lot more exciting than the first 16, 17, 18 days because this is a good roster, it is a veteran roster, and there is tremendous competition all over the board. It's one of the more uh, competitive by uh, just depth and those things, rosters that I've seen on a Titans roster in quite some time. And Coach Mack laid it out right, and you did too. These joint practices are as important and in a lot of cases more important than the preseason games themselves because you get to truly uh, look at how your personnel is against their personnel. And then the lights come on, you do what you do, you know, uh, on Saturday night. But uh, there's a lot that has to be sorted out between now and then. And you're right. I think you're exactly right. This next 16 days is going to be a roller coaster ride. Coach. Mike Vrabel was asked if he was disappointed that Tom Brady is not going to be here this week. He did not like that question very much, as you would expect. But is he disappointed Tom Brady's not going to be here because of the player Tom Brady is? When you talk about testing your people against the best, you know, that, that's, what, that's what you would want. But I can understand why he wouldn't like that question so much. You know, we, we know the relationship. So, I mean, because it, it it's a personal, you know, uh, thing with that nature. So, but when you talk about, when you, and we'll still get plenty of testing, but we, we saw a couple of years ago when Tom Brady came in here, I mean, that was a surgical seven-on-seven seven that, that he put on. And that's, and, that, and, that's, and that's what you want. I mean, all the years that I coached, I mean, we went to Berlin one year, and I was with the Bears, and we, we were spent a week with the San Francisco 49ers. We were a great team. But you know how much it helped my defensive guys to be able to practice against Joe Montana every day? I mean, it's just that's what you want in this league. It's the best against the best. And so I can understand, though, why Mike Vrabel would not, you know, address it. And we'll get plenty of good work without Tom Brady here. Amy, are you disappointed Tom Brady's not going to be here? You know I'm not, actually. I mean – Best of luck to him and his preparations for the season. But, you know, it's always just such a circus when Tom Brady's around. There's a lot of hoopla. Everybody wants to see this guy. I mean, he's just a player. There's lots of players out there. He's the greatest quarterback of all time. Yeah, and that's fine. But, like, <laughs> what a circus. I, I, he's no, 45 years old. He sure is. And, and he's I mean, still that's, one of the five best quarterbacks in the league. It's so great. I mean, God love Tom Brady. However, it's a circus. And I am a little thankful that the circus is going to be somewhere else. Really? Yeah, I don't need all of that. Give the people what they want, Mikey. Hang yeah, on, Amy. I'm just, I'm just not into all the things. Everybody get oh, it's Tom You're going to run a live audience every Amy, week, aren't you? Oh, Amy, Tom I'm coming Brady. in as your reinforcement because I feel the same way. See? When like, he was here two years ago, I, yeah, it was neat seeing him practice and seeing what he did, whatever. Fine, but there's way too many people there. Sorry. Sweaty and smelly like the rest of them. Coach, 
you guys are seeing the true character now of Amy Wells. <laughs> I, I'm just hey, not that impressed. Hey, He's you, good. You know, you know, we have a Titans Amy Coach Mac podcast. That's and you another good podcast, and, by and the and way. And you understand what whose name is first, Titans Amy, because I'm scared of her. And really, when you when you get down to it, I mean, she is she is really really hardcore about some things, and you don't want to cross her. So, Amy, if you're happy that he's not here, I'm happy. Just know that. <laughs> the work aspect of it is valid. You want your guys going up against the best guys. Yes. But, I mean, there, there are a lot of good players for the Bucks. They did win a Super Bowl within the last Two couple years. of years. Yeah. Like, they're a pretty good team. I think you can find some other competition to get some pretty good work done. I don't need that guy running around. You're just excited to see Blaine Gabbard. <laughs> he did go to Mizzou, M-I-Z. Yes, that's Get it, great. Blaine. Speaking of M-I-Z, <laughs> the great Ashley Farrell mm -hmm. threw out an outstanding question for Coach Mack when we were doing the exercise earlier today. When teams go through this process, through the whole cut-down process, Coach, do they do a board and put players in other teams and their own team? in pods like you do a draft board so they can assess where they might be better if they pick up a player from another team. Well, I'm so proud of Ashley. That's Isn't that a, a great question? No, no, that's a, that's a wonderful question. I mean, I six years ago when I came here, Amy Wells and Ashley Farrell asked me to sit down and spend, we spent five months grinding tape, teach us the NFL. They wanted to learn. Their notebooks were full. Both of these, I mean, they, they're impressed. That's a great question. The answer is yes. And a great, a great example of that, guys, is just think about what John Robinson and his entire personnel group did, both collegiately and in the, in, in the, the NFL, because you have two distinct personnel groups, college groups and the professional groups. Think of what they did last year bringing 91 players in here. We played 91 players last year and still won 12 ball games and were the number one seed. That, that, that's an amazing, amazing <laughs> ability to do something now they will do the same thing now they have they have people assigned to every division out watching these teams right now and so the, the answer to, to Ashley's question is yes you have some people that you will put up there that you know are untouchable for you but also the people that you send out say I send Amy Wells out and she's got the entire NFC East she will know she'll say hey he'll, she'll come back and tell coach Vrabel these guys are kind of on the fence with this team. This is, this is how strong this team is here. These guys might be available. Let's, let's bring out our reports from college. Let's bring out our, our professional reports and see where they stack up with the guys that might be on the fence with us at this position. They absolutely do that. It's a great question by Ashley. Red, how many do you think they bring in when it's all said and done? How many veterans do they add to this roster when, when they get down to the very end? I must say three or four. Um, I think there'll be, there's a chance, a couple of undrafteds they have in their own training camp right now. The Titans make this roster. But I think there's three or four veterans possibly that uh, could be added to this thing e even after the cut before week one. Is that your, your number is three or four? I think so, yes. Amy? Yeah, I was going to say four. I was going to say three. I think. Yeah. So I, I think for this group who's in here right now, they're after 50 roster spots at this moment. I think so, Mike. And, and, and the key is I've been on all types of teams in my years in this league, some really good and some really bad. And so if you've got a not-so-good team, that number is usually pretty high right. that you start to go to get. This is a good football team. But they can, they can be better at those other slots possibly. And, I, and that's what they've got their eye on now. You always want to be able – to have the cuts be really hard. Because if the cuts are really hard, then you know you've got the kind of squad you want to start the year with. All right, so rules. And we wanted to, to let the OT people know some of the points of emphasis on the rules. I'm going to run through these rather quickly. We want you to be ahead. So when you are watching Titans football as rookie season ticket members, as when you're here on Saturday night, or whether you're watching on television somewhere or hopefully listening to the radio. You will know what the points of emphasis are for the preseason. Sportsmanship and taunting, that goes on. They are continuing to try to get as much of the taunting out of the game as possible, not because they don't like showboating, 
but because it leads to problems, Coach. Well, it leads to a lot of problems, especially on the field. I mean, I, when I first started coaching in this league 37 years ago, uh, it was the Wild West. I mean, everything went. Yeah, everything went, and that wasn't a great deal. But we lived with it because that's the way it was now. It's much better the way it is now. You don't need it. All right, Rhett, here's the second one, and I want to get your thoughts on this. There are changements in enforcement to the roughing the passer penalty. If you are a defender on the ground and you swipe at, grab, or wrap a passer, you are no longer deemed to be making forcible contact and you will not be penalized for that. So if you're on the ground crawling towards the quarterback and you grab his ankle, that is no longer a penalty. Glancing or grazing blows to the quarterback's head, particularly when matching the quarterback's hand, attempting to alter a pass. In other words, you're trying to bat a pass down. So you're putting your hand in front of his, and when you do, you might catch his face mask or catch the side of his helmet barely. That is no longer deemed to be violent and will no longer be penalized. So they are taking some things out of roughing the passer. Well, and I like this because, you know, the emphasis for several seasons now has been on safety of the players, and in particular the quarterback position. But how many times have you seen somebody's team, and it's happened to the Titans too, where it's been a grazing blow to a quarterback that was a costly penalty that maybe was the difference in something. And I think it's good that they've reeled in this just a little bit Still keeping the quarterback protected, but looking at this with a more keen eye. Well, the thing about the quarterback, you couldn't, you, they put it in there where you couldn't hit him below the knees. All right. And then the, the reason for that is if a quarterback is manipulating the cylinder, which forms when, when it's not a pocket, it's really a cylinder because the ends curve around and then you've got a solid front. When they do that, and, and they have to step forward to throw. That's where you see a lot of quarterback lower leg injuries happen because the, the plant leg is solid in the ground, cleats in the ground, and then you come in and you hit it, there's nowhere for it to go. Okay, so they've tried to take all of that out. Now, what they did before they put this part in, now then it became anytime you touched him below the knee, no matter how it happened, it was a penalty. I like what they're doing here. The other thing with matching the hand, and when Mike talks about matching the hand, he talks about guys, when you're rushing the passer, Amy, you be the quarterback. Put your right hand up. Just put your right hand up. No, it's a little higher than that, please. Thank you. Okay, just stay Repeat there. after me. Yeah, just stay no, there. That's no, different. Just stay. Am I throwing? Am I yeah. high-fiving? What is you're the, throwing. the, what's the you're, motion? You're okay. Just keep it there for a minute. I'll be through in a minute. Let's say, so when, when, when they've got a right hand up, if you're rushing from the quarterback's hand, you want to match it. See, you want to match it with your right hand and get across and match it. But, and so what they want to do is a lot of times when you match it, if you miss it, you'll graze the quarterback's face or graze the side of his helmet. Do not that's graze not, my face. That's the, okay, now go ahead and put it down. <laughs> that, I, I, I would never hit you in the face. <laughs> but, so to me, to me, I like it. What they're just trying to do, they put in a broad general rule to, for protection. Now they're trying to refine it, and I like it. All right, so holding. The league liked the way holding, offensive holding, was enforced last year, and they want it to continue. They don't want all the holding calls. So the emphasis for calls, point of attack holds, and clear path to the quarterback holds. Coach Mack, what does that mean? Well, that means any time that, 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 that there is a – there is a the, the cylinder again, they're, they're throwing, and a, a lineman is beat – and egregiously reaches out just to wrap a guy up so he doesn't flatten the quarterback. So it's a clear path to the quarterback, and he's, he's, he's grabbed by some way, either from behind, by the jersey. Most of the times what they'll do is they'll reach around and grab the waist and turn them. They, they want that called. And, and I'm all for this because, to me, a lot of times holding calls can be so, so nebulous, and they're big calls. All right, the fourth one, Amy, I want you to touch on this one. The league wants officials to, I'm just going to read this verbatim because I think it's interesting. Great. The league wants officials to focus more on running with defenders and wide receivers on the deep balls. The league does not believe that defenders who are running in phase with wide receivers should be punished for basic hand fighting if that contact 
does not affect the receiver's ability to catch the football. The same goes for receivers who are hand fighting with defensive backs when it comes to offensive pass interference. The league believes if officials are running with the play, the better to make a determination on this. Incidental contact should not be called because this is the most costly foul in the NFL. It is not a 15-yard penalty. It is a spot foul. So if a DB is running with a receiver and they're just battling back and forth and the ball falls incomplete, they're not going to call it. Right. And they want the official in better position to call it. Yeah, and it puts the onus kind of on the official to make sure that they are there so they can make a call and make a common sense call. I mean, being able to be there, evaluate what was going on, was it egregious? Did it impact someone's ability to make a play? Call it. Was it not egregious? Was it just along the regular realm of, you know, doing what you do to defend or try to get separation or whatever? Okay. I mean, they want to have someone there who can make a good evaluation on what was happening in that moment and not have it be a one-size-fits-all ruling that doesn't necessarily apply to every situation. They're kind of taking the one-size-fits-all nature out of it and getting a little bit more in the moment context common sense in there. This is the most devastating penalty in our game. It really is. It, it's a game flipper. It's a game changer. And I remember, remember you know, when it came in, and it, it came in to accelerate scoring. That's why it came in. Because before any of this is in and before any of the rules were in where you couldn't contact them but for five yards down the field, you know, we used to could beat them up. I mean, you could beat them up all you wanted. And so but they, this was put in for scoring, and it's gotten a little bit out of hand, and it is a game changer. I'm glad that they're doing this. And Amy gave a great explanation for it because there, it's not just one fits all. And I like the fact that and, – and most, and most of your side judges – your back judges are already lined up back there, but most of your side judges have to run with that play. They have to run with the play, and, and I'm all for what they're trying to do. So, Coach Mack, as a follow-up, with them doing this and changing this rule, if they, if they enforce this regularly, that's going to change the way offenses do a little bit of their business because sometimes it's just flat out, we can go out there and have our guy run a route, and he can draw a defensive pass interference. Well, and that, that's some of the ones you see where the ball is just going up, really, in, in desperation situations. That's why, guys, think about this. And, and, you know, lifetime coach in the league, I know this. You never see it called. You know on Hail Marys? Do you know how much contact there is on Hail Marys? You guys know what that is. We have a bunch of guys jumping up for it. It's never called, right? It's never called on Hail Marys. And there's pass interference on When you're coaching defense and it's a last minute, you, you say interfere with them because they're not going to call it. They won't call that because it's, it, it, it's a game-changing play. It can be a game flipper, okay? So you're going to say, do as much contact as you want. I think this is going to start going towards that as far as if it's egregious, you're yanking, you're pulling, you're pulling a guy down, impeding his way to the ball, they'll call it. But some of those contacts that they call, and, and both, look, both for and against. Right. Both for and against. I, I, I like what we're doing here with this. I'm going to be interested to see in the preseason. Well, we had one. We had one in our game. You know, when Traylon Burks was down there, mm -hmm. we had one with, with Traylon Burks. That was, a, that was a combat catch, you know, throw up down there deep, deep, deep in the end zone. You know, and that, that, that possibly could have been called. I think this was a reason why it wasn't. All right, here's the next one. Rhett, you're going to love this one. <laughs> Quarterbacks have been notified if they are running north-south along the boundary. In other words, if they're running down the sideline and they're looking for extra yards, and quarterbacks have been given the benefit that they've been able to do that little toe dance at the end of plays and pick up three, five extra yards, knowing that if they get hit, there's going to be a flag thrown. Well, now the league is saying, and this is a point of emphasis, if they are looking to pick up extra yards before going out of bounds, they're considered runners and are free to be contacted unless they are clearly out of bounds. The same holds true for running backs and receivers trying to pick up extra yards. The league wants officials to examine plays once the runner is clearly out of bounds for potential personal foul penalties, like what happened to Jalen Hurts, the Eagles quarterback. In the preseason game the other day, yes. Against the Jets. Right. So he's almost off the white. 
he's two steps out of bounds and the guy whacks him. That's a penalty. If he's on the edge and the defender has committed and does not know he's going out of bounds for sure, they're going to give the defender the benefit of the doubt because they're saying he's a runner. And with all of these running quarterbacks in the league now, the majority of which can now run, it seems like a fair change. So, in essence, doing the tightrope to get uh, another first down is going to have consequences. So what you got to do is get as much as you can, but do the tightrope on the other side, out of bounds, and hope somebody hits you and you get to draw the penalty. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're plotting. Yes. <laughs> you are plotting. It's called strategy, Mike Key. But, I mean, there has been, what we've seen in recent years from defenders is they have pulled up in multiple situations with a quarterback, and the quarterback knows they're going to have to pull up, and so they've taken advantage of it. And so they've it. taken advantage of yeah. that to gain extra yardage. And the competition committee has said, not cool. No, no, and that's absolutely right. And I'm glad that they, I'm glad they zeroed in on this. It's kind of like Kenny Pickett when he had the fake slide and then took off running when he was in college, you know, and ran for 50, 57 yards. The quarterbacks need to be protected, but they also need to understand that once they put themselves in a situation where they are a runner, then they can get hit. Look out, Tom Brady. <laughs> and it all comes home right there. There's a lot of Tom Brady hate here. It's not hate. Just, no, I'm talking about in the room. Be I'm talking about in the room. They're coming for you. All buddy. right. Okay, here's the, the next one. Once a runner's progress has been clearly stopped, officials are being asked to blow the play dead more quickly. The idea is that fouls often occur in these situations where players are not sure if the play is over, both offensive and defensive players. And this is the reason for a point of emphasis. I think it's a good rule, and I think it would help if the officials would actually do this. Just blow a whistle. Blow the Once whistle. Once you blow the whistle, then it's done. Just blow a whistle. And, you know, a lot of this, and a lot of this comes from, you know, offensive linemen are coach too, and very right, rightfully so. If your runner's still alive, go clean the pile. If your runner's still alive, go clean the pile. Defenders are also the same way. If that pile is moving, go in there and hit it. You know, and so to me, it just makes sense because what happens is the longer you extend it, the more out of control it gets. Well, for two reasons. You have the player safety part of it where linemen get ankles rolled up on. And then the other part is, and we've seen Titans games where it got a little chippy and, you know, maybe whoever comes to Nissan Stadium, they're not a big fan of theirs, right? And so the longer it goes, the more things like that escalate. I think if they'll blow this dead early, and often when this happens, it's going to be a benefit in both of those areas. Are you for this? I'm always for player safety. Okay. But? Yes. There's no but. <laughs> well, I thought you were going to say, but oh, there's not oh, going to be as many fights. Well, insert that's what insert I was Tom say. Brady I, here. Amy, I knew you knew I was going to say that. I do like when things get a little heated and a little feisty. So, I mean... Just give it a beat, then blow Does the that come from when you and Jarrell Casey got in a fight with the Jaguars <laughs> that year? <laughs> that time Jarrell Casey and I fought some people. Yeah, probably. I really enjoyed being For a the, part of that. Let's retell this. Do you want me this. to tell the story? Tell the story. It's 2000, <laughs> what oh. is it, 17? Yes. It 2017. Was so, it was so great. We're trying to make the playoffs. we got to beat Jacksonville. We just beat Jacksonville. Very exciting. I'm supposed to interview Jarrell Casey after the game. I go up to him. We're on the field. Like, All right, Jarrell, you ready? I'm just hey, waiting way, for the signal. Jarrell is great. The nicest Jarell guy. Jarrell is the best. Yeah. And so he says, yeah, sure, absolutely. Great game. He's all, you know, he's exhausted but, like, excited because <laughs> they just won. And so we're standing there, and I'm waiting for them to give me the signal in my ear to go. And it's like, okay, three, two, and some guy who played for the Jags, I don't even remember who it was, came over and started talking to Jarrell. And I hear Jarrell say, man, you don't want to do that. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute. No, 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 not yet. We can't go now. Wait. <laughs> and I turn around, and Jarrell's just throwing hands with this guy. And I was like, this is it. I'm in a fight. And <laughs> it's happening around me, so I'm involved. And then all of a sudden, some of the other guys from, like, the defensive line start running over. And here comes Brian Arakpo. And Derek Morgan's coming over at that time. And they're all getting involved. And I won't leave because I'm, I'm part of this now. We're teammates. And so I'm looking around. I'm looking for my guy. I don't have a guy because nobody cares about me. But I'm looking. And then it kind of fizzles out and ends and the show's over. But then Monday, 
I walk into the building, and Brian Arakpo comes up to me and goes, you didn't move in that fight. I said, no, sir, I didn't. And he said, that was pretty hardcore. <laughs> I said, yeah, it is. And it's Brian Arakpo, so what he really said was, that was pretty hardcore. <laughs> and I was like, this is it. I'm a fighter now. I just did it. So ever since then, Jarell and I, from time to time, will recall the time that we fought all of the Jags. So as the years have gone on, it's gotten bigger and more intense. And God, what a time to be alive. That was so great. Uh, you were great. Yeah, I really, uh, yeah. You went from Titans, Amy, to hardcore. Amy. Hardcore. Yes. But I do really enjoy some scuffles how from happy, time to how time. How happy was she with that? She was so happy. She was she, so proud of herself. She was so herself. happy. Gratuitous she right. violence, Amy. She, no, no, she was right she'll in be the middle of it. Yeah, like she's the, the one that talks about player safety being important. And yeah, that she and wants then she's throwing her hands with defensive I've, I've, I've heard her tell the story <laughs> since then, and she's told it as to where she got a guy in an arm bar, oh, threw yeah. him on the ground, and put a <laughs> choke hold on him. And, well, I mean, the legend she, grows every time she tells it, right? Yeah, no, no. She's just, I mean. I took on more and more every time she told the tale. The truth of the story is, though, when it's started she didn't move and there is just, a picture she stood and right there's the a picture and they were two feet away from her swinging mm-hmm. wing it it was it was on it was great amy i was impressed that's it why she has so her own great. podcast now you're going to clap for her again aren't yeah. you yeah <laughs> that's that's why i say i'm still scared of her <laughs> it was just great i like the passion see this is the fun of doing this right yeah all right, so the last one illegal contact calls were down to 36 last year the normal number is 97. Wow. So they are going to call illegal contact. The league wants officials to focus on enforcement of the rule by abiding by the strict interpretation that eligible receivers cannot be contacted once five yards beyond the line of scrimmage. That can happen, however, when the quarterback is outside the pocket. The league knows that determination is difficult, but they are putting the pressure on the crews to A, don't let defenders do this, and B, make sure you have an idea as a group and you'll have to work together when the quarterback is outside the pocket because they think it's important not to let guys get mugged past five yards. The only thing that I hope that they, that they work through with this, and again, you know, I was with Jeff Fisher for a lot of years. He was on the competition committee, was the you know, co-chair of that committee for 16 years. So I just hope that they get enough enough of a bright lights vision on the fact that I really don't like the, uh, the contact away from the play. The contact away from the play is bothersome to me still. You know, and, and I, I hope that they put all of that into the purview when they're looking at it. Much like what they've done with holding. Exactly. I hope that's what they do. You think there's a common theme in, in all of the, the areas I just mentioned, Amy? I think the common theme is common sense. I think that they have taken the rules and kind of brought them back into the realm of reflecting what actually happens in the game. I think for a while, you know, they really wanted to emphasize holding. So they called every holding instance on the field, no matter what it was, no matter where it happened. They really wanted to emphasize player safety. So they kind of maybe overprotected the quarterback a little bit. Now we're bringing it back into what is actually happening within the context of your standard football game and are making allowances for context and are making allowances for what is actually conceivably going to happen throughout the course of a game. So it seems to me that they're making the letter of the law reflect an actual football game a little bit more. And I really like that. I I think, Rhett, you know, you and I have been doing this together for 25 years, and and everybody likes to talk about the good old days, and certainly we have memories going all the way back to the Memphis year and all of those sorts of things. But I, I have to say, and I thought this the other night in Baltimore, it's a better game. With, with the rules that they have, even with some of the safety things, I know some people say, oh, it's two-hand touch. I don't believe that. I think there's still physicality, but I think I think it's a better game. I thought that was a good preseason game the other night. It until was. maybe the second half of the fourth quarter when it got a little sloppy. Absolutely. And for anybody that wants to say it's two-hand touch, ask any of these players. They'll show you the bruises. <laughs> They'll show you how stiff and sore they are. But, no, listen, I think Coach Mack said it perfect. They had broad general rules that they have gone under some refinement to 
make this more of an applicable situation. It's, it's why I believe the National Football League is the best product of the four major sports in North America because they constantly are looking to make it better, not only for the players involved, but for all of you season ticket members who are going to watch every week. I like what Amy's, Amy's answer was great. I mean, it really was. Mike said common theme, and she said common sense, and I think that covers it. I think that's, that just says it all. Great job, Coach. You've given us a good summary today. Well, I'm not smart. No, you are. You're very and, smart. And these people, and, don't I, you appreciate Coach Mack? Let I him know. know. I, this is the first time I've met all of these people, so I want them to think I'm smart. Okay. Now, once they listen to me well, a lot, don't let him tell you he's not smart because yeah. that's not true. They'll figure out that I'm not. No, no. But no. let them think that when they leave today. No, all right, so true. let's update a couple things going on. Amy and I have a live look in on all of the Titans' digital channels from the practice on Wednesday, August 17th. We'll start at 930. And so if you want to see what's happening in that practice and you can't make it over to Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park, Amy and I will have a live look in. We will. TennesseeTitans.com or all of the Titans' social channels. Twitter is a Everything. good place to check. We'll get you there. Mike. Yeah. Please, the shout out. Hey, we, we had practice today. It was family yes. day. Had all the kids there from the, the, the Titans, you know, employees. It was wonderful. I loved it. All the kids. There's a young man, Brendan. Brendan Myers. Brendan Myers. Came up to me, and his mother works for the. Works, Shannon. Shannon works for the Titans. Said, Coach Mack, he just wanted to meet you. He listens to every OTP. And so I said, I promise you that today, when we do this OTP, we will give you a shout out. So Mike Keith. Shout out. Shout out. Shout out to Brandon. Brandon Myers. Brandon Myers. Thanks, brother. All right. Well, he even got applause. He got applause. He got applause. That's amazing. Brandon, that's awesome. And, and we also you, need to give it. Do you want people to clap for you? Is that what I'm No, hearing? no, they already did. Right. Thank you so much. There it Thanks, is. guys. I love the live audience. It's like the best thing. This is so much better than us. It, in it's a so closet. much better than. Can we bring them to all the OTPs? We, we can cut? bring them on. <clears throat> I like this. Saturday, five o'clock Central Time. Amy Wells, Rhett, Brian, Titans countdown on 104.5 The Zone and all of our Titans radio stations yes. throughout the Mid South. Yes, Titans countdown presented by our good friends at Farm Bureau Health Plans, who also sponsor the OTP, and uh, we're going to have a feature on a young man who you got to see last Thursday night who really started putting on a show named David and Nenny. And David is uh, a player from Houston. He's an outside linebacker, undrafted. He had two quarterback sacks and two plays. The second one was a strip sack. Um, and he, he's got a great story. Did not start playing football till his junior year in high school. And here he's played the preseason game and has some things to put on tape. Nice, bright young man. We'll do a feature on him. You'll hear from the general manager, John Robinson. We always talk to Coach Vrabel with his keys to the game and, and also what has happened since the last preseason game leading up to Tampa and all of the joint practices. And, you know, Amy Wells and, and I started off by going rapid fire and giving you some sound from the players and the stories you're going to need to follow. And then in segment two... Coach Mack comes in, and we go to school, and he tells you, and I promise you, if you listen to Titans Countdown, you listen to the second segment right there, you're going to know around 5.15 exactly what could or most likely will take place in the ballgame because he is smart, contrary to his own popular belief. And kickoff is 6 o'clock Central Time. You'll all be here, right? Yes. yes. Tom Brady won't, but Mom. you'll all be here. Yes. <laughs> And so then, a week from tomorrow, a week from Monday, we start the Mike Vrabel Show at 6 Central Time, August right. 22nd. So we've got a lot coming up. We've got a Titans All Access out right now. Yep, we which do. Which is a really good show, which you could find at a television station near you. And they generally show it multiple times. So lots going on. And we're so excited for our rookie season ticket members to be here. Thank you for joining us for this OTP. I think you see we have a lot of fun. And uh, that's the whole gist of this. It is a lot of fun to be associated with your Tennessee Titans. So for Rhett Bryan, Coach Dave McGinnis, Amy Wells, and Mike Keith, we thank all of you for listening and for being here for the OTP. Welcome to